Around March of 2014, I started talking to this girl on Tinder. She seemed cool and fun, and after about a week of talking, she suggested we meet up in person. She invited me to this coffee shop, and I accepted. However, the day of, she started messaging me, saying she had something to tell me. Her pictures on Tinder weren't actually of her, and yes, she was a guy. He claimed that he really liked talking to me though, and begged me to still meet up with him. Naturally, I declined. I blocked his profile and just continued on with my life. About a week later, I started talking to another girl. Once again, she seemed cool and fun and we hit it off right away. She asked me if I spoke to other people on Tinder frequently, and rather stupidly, I told her about my previous encounter with the man lady. Weeks later, I would realize that this new girl was the same girl as the week before. She asked me if I wanted to meet up, and I said sure, as long as it was in a public place. We decided on a cafe, and the next day I sat at the table waiting. Five, then ten, then fifteen minutes had passed, and she was nowhere to be found. I then peered out of the window, and saw, from across the street, a man staring at me intently. I looked away waited a few seconds, and looked back, but he was still just standing there, staring. At that point, I left the cafe, got on my bike, and booked it home. I was definitely a little freaked out, but tried to pull myself together, and reasoned that no one could have followed me. Then I deleted my Tinder profile, and things were normal for a few weeks. About three weeks later, I started getting these phone calls. The numbers always showed up as unknown. I picked up the first few times to some guy breathing heavily into the phone. I was already a little freaked out. After about a day, I stopped picking up any call unless it displayed the caller's name. Then, I started receiving texts. At first, they were all pretty harmless calls for attention, begging me to meet them in person. Then it changed to very sexual texts, until eventually the messages became threatening, and whoever was messaging me started throwing out my family and friends' names and their whereabouts, saying he or she would get them involved unless I answered. Because they were texting me, I could see a displayed number, but when I called phone providers, they told me the number couldn't be traced and that it was likely a track phone. Great. I waited about two weeks, not responding to the text, thinking I shouldn't feed the troll. But eventually, it just became too much. I started getting upwards of 50 texts and phone calls a day. I would wake up to 10 or 20 texts every morning. I then decided just to change my number altogether. The texting and calls stopped for a while, but sure enough, it started happening again. I called my phone provider, asking if they ever gave out numbers at a user's request, and they said their policy stated that they wouldn't and couldn't unless a valid identification was provided. Then one day, I tried logging onto my Facebook, but was somehow denied. Within a day, friends started contacting me, asking me what the hell I was doing, saying that they were getting terrible messages from my account. In particular, one of my girlfriends was receiving messages about her mom who had died years ago. I apologized profusely and told people what was going on. I contacted Facebook and explained the situation, and they helped me access my account again, at which point I had it deactivated for a while. Enough was enough at this point. I decided to contact the FBI, explaining what had been going on for over a month now. They documented everything, but told me that since I or any of my friends and relatives were in no immediate danger, they probably wouldn't be able to do anything at all. At this point, I felt stuck. I thought about hiring a private investigator or a hacker, 
I decided against it, however, and just hoped it would fade out if I never answered. I left my Facebook deactivated and continued to ignore any texts and phone calls I received. I never had any trouble at home, but some of my closest friends received the occasional text as well, which freaked us all out. I hated that they got dragged into it too. One day, I came home and things felt very eerie. Door unlocked, windows open, and no one home. A strong breeze running through the apartment. I did a check of the place and found nothing else weird, so I locked everything up and just waited for my roommates to get home. It's been almost seven months now. And the calls and texts have more or less stopped. I'll get an occasional text, but at most one every two weeks. At the peak of it, I was receiving almost a hundred texts a day. It definitely affected my social and personal life. I became much more weary of the people around me and of my surroundings. I just felt like I couldn't really focus on anything until this all stopped. Work was difficult though I tried to maintain my composure as best I could. Everything was just weird. Life was weird. I've since stopped using all forms of dating apps and websites. Things are getting back to normal at this point, and I just want to put it all behind me. I'm moving at the end of this year, so it'll be nice to have a fresh start in a new place. I'm not going to sit here and say that all dating apps are dangerous and that no one should use them but definitely cover your bases. Ask more questions before meeting someone. FaceTime them first. Skype. Anything. I was naive about it, and I regret it. Be safe, stick close to your friends, and try to sometimes meet people in more traditional ways. <laughs> Let me preface this by saying that this story happened when I was a lot younger and less worldly-wise about the creeps of the world. Had I known what I know now, this story would have ended before it even began. This story begins when I, a 16-year-old girl, got bored one day and decided to download a version of the Tinder app. After a couple of swipes, a guy's face popped up and what intrigued me was that he didn't have his name in his profile. Think M.S. Park instead of Mark. Now, he didn't seem like a rapper, so I swiped right out of curiosity. We matched straight away and began talking. Just your average run-of-the-mill conversation. What do you do for fun? Been to any parties recently? That kind of thing. After a bit of digging, it emerged that he went to the school at the bottom of my road, so we arranged to meet that weekend. At this point, I didn't even know his name, but felt too awkward to ask it after we'd been talking for all this time. Saturday came, and Mark turns up about 20 minutes late. He's carrying a rose, presumably to make up for the fact that he's only around 5 foot 2 which had been cleverly omitted in the photos he'd posted. I'm not usually into short guys, but I humored him, and we went and sat in a park in the town center to talk. We talked for about two hours about everything and nothing at all, until Mark asked me if he could be so bold as to kiss me. I was flattered, but declined. He persisted, saying that it was very important until I lost my temper finally and asked him why. He explained to me that he suffered from sex-based migraines and if he was deprived of sexual contact for too long, he would get an excruciating headache that would render him immobile for 48 hours. Although I was naive, I wasn't stupid enough to believe this nonsense, but wanted to get home quickly after this meeting had turned sour. I leant over, gave him a quick peck on the cheek, and hurried away into the piercing parlor across the road, where the owners knew me and talked with me for an hour until I felt secure enough to get the bus home. 
I thought that this would be the end of the encounter, and traveled home calmly. Me and my mother have never had a strong relationship, and I didn't want to really talk to her about it. So when she asked about my day, I just brushed it off and said I had met a friend for lunch. After dinner, I went upstairs to my room and pulled out my phone. My stomach dropped. There was a Snapchat notification from MS Sparks. My username must have been on the profile I set up on Tinder. How stupid of me, I think back now, for I could have avoided a good many unsolicited dick pics otherwise. I gingerly opened it. It was a 10 second video of him lying on his bed at home, looking dazed and confused. The caption? Look what you do to me. I realized that he was actually faking a migraine and filming it to send to me. I blocked the account and sat watching TV for a while. No harm done, I thought. Wrong again. From knowing where I went to school and the fact that I have an unusually spelled first name, a friend request came in from Mark a couple of days later. I declined, but he just sent it again. I was a little weirded out, but he seemed to have mutual friends with me, and from his profile, I could learn more about him, i.e. how to avoid him. The messages started pouring in, starting with, I really enjoyed today, I hope we can see each other again soon, and ending with such gems as, I need you, insert my name here. I laughed and just blocked him again. One day, as I was catching my bus to school, a familiar face smiled at me from the bus stop. It was Mark again, this time with his friends. I wasn't suspicious, as my bus stop was opposite his school, and I vaguely knew one of his friends, so I smiled, talked, and made pleasantries until my bus came. This was to be the first of many encounters with Mark, all of which I brushed off as a coincidence since he lived and went to school in the same part of town I did. The last encounter I had with Mark was on my way to meet a friend. The week before I had severely twisted my knee playing netball and was struggling to walk from my bus stop to where my friend with a car had arranged to meet me. As I turned around the corner, who should appear but Mark? smiling widely and greeting me with a wave. He asked what had happened to my leg. I told him it had been a netball injury. He asked where I was going. I told him I was meeting my friend. He asked what time I was going to meet her, and at this point I just said in about an hour. He said his house was right around the corner, and putting his hand firmly on my lower back, he offered that I could wait there with a cup of tea until my friend came. I tried to protest, saying I would be fine waiting in the cafe, but Mark insisted and half-guided, half-pushed me to his house. When we got in, I asked if I could use the bathroom, to which he said yes and showed me to. I texted my friend after locking myself in there, and said that a guy I vaguely knew had let me wait in his house and she could come pick me up from there. I didn't tell her the whole story, as I didn't want to worry her and or have her phone my mother, with whom I would have met a worse fate than with Mark. Mark then knocks on the door, asking if I was okay. I said yes, but that I'd be a couple of minutes, and he agreed to wait downstairs for me. When I let myself out of the bathroom, I walked downstairs to find Mark lying motionless on the floor of the living room slash kitchen. I panicked, thinking something had happened to him, and went to check his pulse. As I reached down, his hand shot out to feel my breast through my shirt, and he weakly croaked out, Need release. I batted his hand away, and tried to stand up to get him a glass of water. Need you, insert my name, feel me. His trousers, which I hadn't looked at until now, were unbuttoned and he was stroking himself eyes now open and locked on me. I freaked out. I ran up the stairs and struggled with the lock on the door, hearing his slow footsteps getting closer. Just as I was opening the door, 
His voice called out from the other end of the corridor. Could you at least clean my oven then? I whisked the door open and slammed it behind me, almost in tears at both the pain in my knee and the sheer weirdness of the situation. After limping a couple roads down from his house, I rang my friend and said there was nothing to worry about, but could she please hurry? She was right around the corner at this point, and we drove off with me telling her everything in between shaky breaths. The weirdest thing about this whole story? A couple of days later I ran into Mark again. He acted as if nothing had happened that day, offered me some gum, and then caught a bus from my bus stop. It was almost as if he didn't even remember anything from that day, and I sure as hell wish I didn't. I haven't seen him around in some time, but that could just be because he's gone off to university. I met Trent on Tinder in October of 2014. He seemed to be my type. Tall, slender, the very definition of twink. It's hard to find many feminine gay guys in the boonies of Oklahoma, so I swiped right. We started talking and set up a date. Everything was amazing for the first couple of months, until the end of the semester, when my roommates moved away. That was when he came to spend some time with me during winter break. When I started wanting to spend some more time with my family for Christmas, Trent decided to let me know that he couldn't go home because he had cut ties with his family. This was a huge red flag if I had ever seen one. But I decided to try and help him find a place to stay and then break up with him. I didn't want to make him homeless. By the time the break had ended, Trent had enrolled at my university and was staying across the hall from me. I knew that it would be awkward when I left him but I wasn't prepared in the slightest for what was about to come. When the new semester began, he knocked on my door, complaining that he couldn't sleep in his own room for several reasons, the most frightening of which was that he was afraid that his roommates would kill him. I reassured him that those were just unreasonable thoughts and sent him back to his room. Not an hour later, Trent comes back to me, threatening suicide. I take him to the hospital, with him sobbing about how I was going to break up with him the entire time. I had never told him I was going to. The next morning, I got 30 phone calls. I changed my number and blocked him on all of the social apps I use. Then he created a new Grindr account and finally coaxed me into meeting him for a conversation. I ended up taking him back because even though he was medicated, he was still unstable. He had attempted suicide after he was released from the hospital. I had moved off campus at that point. Fast forward about three months and now he's moved off campus into an apartment he can't afford. I had been trying to get him the hell out of my house because he was essentially living with me since he couldn't just stay at his new place on campus without attempting suicide. At that point, I was in a marriage-like relationship with Trent against my will, because I was afraid to be the cause of someone's suicide. One night, I decided that I just didn't care about Trent anymore, and broke up with him. And this is where it gets dark. For an hour, we went around and around with me begging through my tears for him to not kill himself, and him essentially trying to force me out of his house so he could commit suicide. It came to him threatening to call the police to tell them that I was psychotic and threatening him within his own home. I left and called the police, and when they arrived they found him attempting to blow up his entire apartment complex. When he got back, the true stalking began. I started receiving up to 50 calls in one day from numbers that would change. He was changing his number to bypass my call block. His attempts to get me to talk to him were just like before. He created several profiles under several different names on several social apps to contact me, leaving just enough information for me to deduce that it was him. His insistence that he wasn't going to hurt me crossed the threshold from creepy 
into almost threatening, like a come out, come out, wherever you are. The entire time, he was trying to get me alone in a room with him. I abandoned my home and moved in with my aunt 20 miles away. One night at 10.30 p.m., I received a call from the police department, notifying me that my apartment had been broken into and that I was needed to check the apartment for missing possessions. He posed as me to get the locksmith to open my door. My drive back to my apartment was through one of the worst lightning storms I have ever seen. When I got there, I had a friend with me, and a baseball bat. I opened the door and noticed that things weren't missing. New things were there. Things that I didn't own. I opened my bedroom door to find Trent's phone on the charger. My bed had been stripped of its sheets. Turning to the window, I saw Trent's clothes in a pile, and that's when the hairs on the back of my neck stood up. I knew he was right behind me. When I turned around, he was in my closet, haunched over and naked. He had a wild look in his eye, and yet exited the closet in the calmest manner imaginable. It was like he was a zombie, pale with rings around his eyes, unkempt hair and a blank expression. I waved my bat at him, but he seemed prepared to die. He asked me to kill him. He tried to wrestle the bat away from me. He tried to prove that he legally lived in my apartment. He tried telling me that he'd given me HIV. I eventually got him into my living room and got him to get dressed before the cops arrived. He lunged at me and the police tackled him. So unfolded the most violent arrest I had ever witnessed. No amount of tasing subdued him. He screamed, Police brutality! I just want to talk to Brian. Why won't you let me talk to Brian? Give me five minutes alone with him. The stalking continued after he posted bail. The next day, he knocked on my apartment door posing as the police. He found me in my class and chased me, eventually laying hands on me, running away when I pepper sprayed him and tried to break into my house again. He was arrested again for trespassing. I got a protective order put out against him after he posted bail the second time. That didn't deter him. He continued his calls. I finished the semester and moved back home, and began reporting every incident of him violating that order, which were numerous. He left for LA, because he thinks that the order is only valid in the state in which it was issued. If he comes back, or if he's arrested in California, I'll be taking him to court. <laughs>